Without further ado, can we please give a massive warm welcome to Robert Shock. Thank you very much, and I do apologize. Um, we got our group got delayed. I don't know exactly what happened, but here we are. And I hope that everyone's here that was supposed to be here. I can't actually see you in the audience. The lights are so bright. Um, but let's let's just uh, take it from here, and I'll try to uh, uh, catch up on some loose time. So I'm Robert Schock, and what I want to do is talk about uh, my work. Really, this is. Uh, quarter century worth of work, so I'll be going back in time, my time, and we will be going back in time, and I will um, show you some of the uh, things I started with, how I got involved with this, and right up to the present day, my most recent thinking. And I'll have to speak quickly and cover a lot of territory today, but not plugging books, I'm plugging information. If you're interested, uh, Forgotten Civilization, there are copies out there, and I go into uh, more detail on most of these topics in uh, Forgotten Civilization. So we're going to focus today on Great Sphinx, Gobekli Tepe, and I'll also talk a little bit about Easter Island and the end of the last ice age. So let's start. We, I am an academic, as you heard. I grew up, if you would, um, trained academic, went to George Washington University for my undergraduate degrees. I have degrees in anthropology, geology. I'm not trying to give you my credentials, I'm telling you where I'm coming from. I went to Yale University as a graduate student, um, earned a couple of master's degrees in geology and geophysics, earned my PhD there at Yale in geology and geophysics, and I was thoroughly trained in the paradigm. So we have this evolutionary paradigm, at least for the last 150 plus years, thanks to one of your people, Charles Darwin. <laughs> and this paradigm has many implications, but one when it comes to humans and human evolution, and particularly the evolution of civilization, is sort of a concept of progress. And then maybe we're going back down again, I don't know. Um, but, but continued progress, and sort of a one-way street, maybe a few little blips, but what I've come to conclude, and this is the question, but I'll tell you the answer right now, do we need to rethink what we think we know when it comes to the development of civilization, the development of high culture? So here's the man that in many ways is responsible for the paradigm that all of us have in our heads at some point, even if it is only to rebut it. But this is V. Gordon Child, and he really solidified the modern paradigm of the origins of civilization, which goes something like this, that all of humanity, as they rise to the level of what we would call, or he would call, civilization, they go through these stages invariably. Uh, they, we start out as savages, humans start out as savages, gatherers, hunters, foragers, there's sort of the low life, if you would, they spend all their time, you know, eking out a living, have no time for other things like arts and sciences. Of course, this is based in part on analogy with modern hunters and gatherers that have been pushed into the ecological extremes, pushed into environments that no one else wants at this point. Because um, are there still savages technically around? Yes. Uh, then we arise to barbarism, barbarians, in a classic sense, or archaeological sense, a technical sense, they have some cultivation, some agriculture, maybe they start to live together in villages, but they're still barbarians, they're still not fully civilized. And lastly, we reach the highest grade, and there is a concept here of height and progression and better and worse, classically, civilization, what we could call high culture, and this includes things, and this is important to remember as we talk, monumental architecture, sophisticated technology, literacy, that is reading and writing, recorded records, cities, that's actually where this term civilization comes from, cities, and by the standard paradigm, which was thoroughly ingrained in my education at an undergraduate and graduate level, 
is that the last stage is not reached until about 3,500 BC, somewhere in the fourth millennium, 6,000 to 5,000 years ago, primarily in Mesopotamia, initially in Egypt, maybe shortly after that, maybe in China around the same time, in the New World much later. So, you know, this is, this is the theory, this is um, something that uh, the 20th century view going to the 21st century, it's not the ancient view, for instance. Uh, this is a fellow, you recognize him? Plato, what did he say? He talked about, for instance, Atlantis in the fourth century BC, and the ancients in general, if you talk about the Greeks, if you think about the Romans, if you think about the Egyptians, they all had a concept of civilization before their civilizations. Plato talks about Atlantis. This is just a diagram if you've read um, uh, Plato's works about Atlantis. The city of Atlantis, the capital of Atlantis, had these circular rings. Keep that in mind, because we'll see that again. And something that is very important, and I'll come back to, is that all these civilizations, ancient civilizations, talked about earlier civilization. Plato actually dates Atlantis, the destruction of Atlantis, if you convert it into modern years, in our modern calendar system, to about 9600 BC, which is an important day, so keep that in mind. So I grew up with this concept of the rise of civilization. The first thing I want to talk about is the Great Sphinx in Egypt, and the rise of civilization in round terms, about 3500 BC by the standard paradigm, the carving of the Sphinx, according to modern Egyptology, as I was taught it, was about 2500 BC, that this was carved de novo from the stone, and something that uh, I started looking into, first in 1990, when I went over there for my first time, was exactly what is going on here. And it was actually in 1999, 1990, almost 25 years ago now, and I started looking into this before my first uh, trip to uh, Egypt, that this paradigm began to crack, at least for me. Because as a geologist, I went there to look at this incredible statue, and it was just not compatible with the time frame that the Egyptologists were telling me. The little orientation, I just like this old map, here's Cairo, there you see the Sphinx. And I first went there in the early 1990s. So some of you may have heard of John Anthony West. Yes. Or even know, that's John Anthony West, and this is myself, uh, over 20 years ago in the Sphinx enclosure. The Sphinx itself is carved out of solid bedrock. Only the head of the Sphinx stood above the bedrock. It's hard to see in this perspective because I'm standing down here essentially where I am on the podium looking up at the Sphinx. But this, see these layers? That corresponds to the body here. The Sphinx is actually carved out of the bedrock and there's what's known as the enclosure or pit or quarry still around it if you haven't been there. Uh, here you can see it somewhat better, and it's due east of the Khafra or Shephron Pyramid, the second pyramid, the Great Pyramid's over here, third pyramid here. See these blocks here? These were actually taken out, and we'll come back to that, taken out when they carved the body of the space. So